that speech, it was my pleasure to return to Salem College in 1957 and deliver the baccalaureate sermon. At that time, I received an honorary Doctor of Literature degree from Salem College. Editor's Comments As you begin the next chapter, the editors would like to reinforce the earlier statement that what you are reading is not just a collection of theories out of which you can cherry-pick what you like. The 13 principles of success were proven by the real-life experiences of the long list of famous successful people cited earlier by Napoleon Hill. His techniques are also practiced and endorsed by the contemporary experts and authors whom the editors mentioned following Hill's list. More than 60 million people have purchased copies of the book that you are now holding in your hands. If this book has proven to be that successful, surely you owe it to yourself to give it every chance to work for you too. Read it. Don't question it. Do it. If you don't, if you think that you know better than Napoleon Hill, if you decide to pick and choose the parts that you will believe or follow, then, if you don't succeed, you will never know if your failure lies with this book or with you. This is the end of the editor's comments. Whatever the months later, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time, his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. Barnes succeeded because he chose a definite goal, placed all his energy, all his willpower, all his effort. He put everything he had into achieving that goal. Five years passed before the chance he had been seeking made its appearance. To everyone except himself, he appeared to be just another cog in the Edison business wheel. But in Edwin Barnes' own mind, he was the partner of Edison every minute from the very day that he first went to work there. It is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate of Mr. Edison's more than he wanted anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose, and he burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life. And finally, a fact. When he went to West Orange, he did not say to himself, I will try to induce Edison to give me a job of some sort. He said, I will see Edison and put him on notice that I have come to go into business with him. He did not say, I will keep my eyes open for another opportunity in case I fail to get what I want in the Edison organization. He said, there is one thing in this world that I am determined to have, and that is a business association with Thomas A. Edison. I will burn all bridges behind me and stake my entire future on my ability to get what I want. He left himself no possible way of retreat. He had to win or perish. That is all there is to the barn story of success. Allow yourself no retreat. A long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation in which he had to make a decision that ensured his success on the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his. He loaded his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy's country, and unloaded the soldiers and equipment. Then he gave the order to burn the ships that had carried them. Addressing his men before the first battle, he said, You see the boats going up in smoke. That means we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win or we perish. They won. Every person who wins in any undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. That is the only way you can be sure of maintaining the state of mind known as a burning desire to win. It is essential to success. The morning after the great Chicago fire, a group of merchants stood on State Street, looking at the smoking remains of what had been their stores. They went into a conference to decide if they would try to rebuild 
or if they would leave Chicago and start over in a more promising section of the country. They decided to leave, all except one. The merchant who decided to stay and rebuild pointed a finger at the remains of his store and said, Gentlemen, on that very spot, I will build the world's greatest store, no matter how many times it may burn down. That was in 1871. The store was built. It still stands there today. The Marshall Fields Department Store is a towering monument to the power of that state of mind known as a burning desire. The easy thing would have been for Marshall Field to do exactly what his fellow merchants did. When the going was hard and the future looked dismal, they pulled up and went where the going seemed easier. Mark well this difference between Marshall Field and the other merchants. It is that difference which distinguishes those who succeed from those who fail. Every human being old enough to understand the value of money wishes for it. But wishing will not bring riches. Desiring riches, with a state of mind that becomes an obsession, then planning definite ways and means to acquire riches, and backing those plans with persistence, a persistence which does not recognize failure, that's what will bring riches. Editor's Comments In other of his writings, Napoleon Hill uses the term definiteness of purpose as being interchangeable with desire. The following explanation is adapted from the Napoleon Hill Foundation's book, Believe and Achieve. Desire or definiteness of purpose is more than goal setting. In simplest terms, your desire is your roadmap to achieving an overall career objective. Your goals represent specific steps along the way. Having a desire or definiteness of purpose for your life has a synergistic effect on your ability to achieve your goals. As you become better at what you do, you devote all of your resources toward reaching your objective. You become more alert to opportunities, and you reach decisions more quickly. Every action you take ultimately boils down to the question, will this goal help me reach my desire, my overall objective, or won't it? Your purpose will become your life. It will permeate your mind, both conscious and subconscious. This is the end of the editor's comments. Six ways to turn desire into gold. The method by which your desire for riches can be transmuted into its financial equivalent consists of six definite practical steps. One, fix in your mind the exact amount of money you desire. It is not sufficient merely to say, I want plenty of money. Be definite about the amount. There is a psychological reason for such definiteness explained in subsequent chapters. 2. Determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money you desire. There is no such reality as something for nothing. 3. Establish a definite date when you intend to possess the money you desire. 4. Create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once, whether you are ready or not, to put this plan into action. 5. Now write it out. Write a clear, concise statement of the amount of money you intend to acquire. Name the time limit for its acquisition. State what you intend to give in return for the money, and describe clearly the plan through which you intend to accumulate it. 6. Read your written statement aloud, twice daily. Read it once just before retiring at night, and read it once after arising in the morning. As you read, see and feel and believe yourself already in possession of the money. It is important that you follow the instructions in these six steps. It is especially important that you observe and follow the instructions in the sixth step. You may complain that it is impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Here is where a burning desire will come to your aid. If you truly desire money so keenly that your desire is an obsession, you will have no difficulty in convincing yourself that you will acquire it. The object is to want money and to become so determined to have it that you convince yourself you will have it. 
If you have not been schooled in the workings of the human mind, these instructions may appear impractical. It may help you to know that the information they convey was given to me by Andrew Carnegie, who made himself into one of the most successful men in American history. Carnegie began as an ordinary laborer in the steel mills, but managed, despite his humble beginning, to make these principles yield him a fortune of considerably more than $100 million. Editor's Comment In today's terms, the value of Carnegie's fortune would be at least $20 billion and probably a good deal more. End of Editor's Comment it may be of further help to know that the six steps were carefully scrutinized by the famed inventor and successful businessman, Thomas A. Edison. He gave his stamp of approval, saying they are not only the steps essential for the accumulation of money, but also for the attainment of any goal. Editor's Comments In the time since Napoleon Hill wrote these words, Advances in our understanding of both the physiology of the brain and the psychology of the mind have yielded a much greater understanding of human motivation. Even so, the methods used by modern motivational experts are essentially the same techniques advised by Hill. Research studies confirm that there is sound psychological basis for doing as Hill advises. Be very specific when setting goals. Perform the physical act of committing those goals to paper and repeat your stated goal aloud to yourself often. These techniques have gained wide acceptance among modern experts in the field. The psychological principle at work is similar to that which underlies auto-suggestion and self-hypnosis, concepts that will be discussed in greater depth in Chapter 5, Auto-Suggestion, and in Chapter 13, The Subconscious Mind. Hill's instruction to See yourself as you will be when you have already achieved your objective is also a specific technique. Today it is commonly taught by motivational experts under the term creative visualization. In Chapter 4 on Faith and in Chapter 5 on Autosuggestion, Hill elaborates on his method. Before moving on, the editors would like to reinforce Hill's advice to follow his instructions to the letter. The editors know there is a tendency for the reader to assume that it is enough for them just to intellectually understand a concept. As you read Hill's six points, you probably found yourself thinking, sure, some people might need to write things down, but I'm not a kid, I get the idea. Or, okay, I understand that saying it out loud might help some less sophisticated people, but I already understand the point intellectually. If you feel that way, let us remind you that many of the most successful people whom you admire did not think they were too smart or too sophisticated to follow Hill's instructions. The editors would again point out that if Napoleon Hill believed the actual act of writing and speaking your goals is important, and if psychologists and motivational experts agree, then you would be foolish not to follow this simple advice. Just do it. This is the end of the editor's comments. The steps call for no hard labor. They call for no sacrifice. To apply them does not call for a great amount of education. But the six steps do call for enough imagination to see and to understand that the accumulation of money cannot be left to chance or luck. You may as well know right here that you can never have riches in great quantity unless you can work yourself into a white heat of desire for money and actually believe you will possess it. The Power of Great Dreams If you are in this race for riches, you should be encouraged by the following truth. The world in which we live is demanding new ideas New ways of doing things, new leaders, new inventions, and new methods, styles, versions, and variations of everything all the time. Behind all this demand for new and better things, there is one quality that you must possess to win, and that is definiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what you want, and a burning desire to possess it. If you truly desire riches, Remember that the real leaders of the world have always been people who harnessed 
and put into practical use the intangible, unseen forces of opportunity. Leaders are the people who convert those opportunities into cities, skyscrapers, factories, transportation, entertainment, and every form of convenience that makes things easier, faster, better, or just make life more pleasant. In planning to acquire your share of the riches, don't let anyone put you down for being a dreamer. To win the big stakes in this changing world, you must catch the spirit of the great pioneers, whose dreams have given to civilization all that it has of value. It is that spirit which serves as the lifeblood of our own country, your opportunity and mine to develop and market our talents. A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. Dreams are not born of indifference, laziness, or lack of ambition. If the thing you wish to do is right and you believe in it, go ahead and do it. Never mind what they say if you meet with temporary defeat. They do not know that every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. Marconi dreamed of a system for sending sound from one place to another without the use of wires. It may interest you to know that Marconi's friends had him taken into custody and examined in a psychiatric hospital when he announced he had discovered a principle by which he could send messages through the air. Evidence that he did not dream in vain may be found in every radio and television set, cellular phone, communication satellite, and every other wireless device in the world. Fortunately, the dreamers of today fare better. Today, your world is filled with an abundance of opportunity that the dreamers of the past never knew. If you doubt this is true, if you are feeling crushed because of a recent failure, you are about to learn how your failure can be your most valuable asset. Almost everyone who succeeds in life gets off to a bad start and passes through many heartbreaking struggles before they arrive. The turning point in the lives of those who succeed usually comes at the moment of some crisis through which they are introduced to their other selves. Editor's Comments Napoleon Hill's concept of the other self is mentioned elsewhere in Think and Grow Rich but he does not comment on it extensively. The following elaboration is taken from his later writings. You've been thinking about your losses to the exclusion of everything else. The more you concentrate on them, the more you attract other losses. Stop thinking about them and make up your mind that you are going to benefit from your experience. Whatever personal obstacles you face, you must start getting to know that side of your personality that knows no obstacles, that recognizes no defeats. Cultivate a friendship with the other you, so no matter what you're doing, you are allied with someone who shares your goals. All the philosophy and advice about persuading others will be much more useful to you if you practice it yourself. This is the end of the editor's comment. Sidney Porter discovered the genius that slept within his brain only after he had met with great misfortune. He was found guilty of embezzlement and confined to a prison cell in Columbus, Ohio. And it was there that he became acquainted with his other self. He began to write short stories. Then, while locked in his cell, he began to sell those stories to magazines under the pen name O. Henry. Through the use of his imagination, he discovered himself to be a great author instead of a miserable criminal and outcast. By the time he was released from prison, O. Henry was the most popular short story writer in the country. Editor's Comments More recently, in another prison, another kind of writer met his other self, and country music gained one of its most talented songwriters and biggest stars. As a kid, Merle Haggard's family home was a converted boxcar in Bakersfield, California. After his father died when Merle was nine, more often than not, home for young Merle was a series of juvenile detention centers. At 16, he quit school. And for the next four years, the only mark Merle Haggard made in the world was a rap sheet for stolen cars, burglaries, and bogus checks. 
By the age of 20, he was serving time in San Quentin and gaining a reputation as a hard case con. Then he met his other self. Inspired by a concert Johnny Cash played for the inmates, plus conversations with men on death row and the time he spent in solitary confinement, Haggard learned that he had another self, and that self had something to say through his music. When he got out of solitary, Haggard asked for the hardest job the prison had to offer. He enrolled in night school courses at the prison, straightened himself out, and won his parole after two and a half years. He went back to Bakersfield and dug ditches during the day so he could polish his songwriting and performing at night. Within three years, he had a recording contract. Within five years, he had his first top ten hit, and his one of the most influential voices in modern country music. This is the end of the editor's comments. Thomas Edison dreamed of a lamp that could be operated by electricity, and he began where he stood to put his dream into action. He failed more than 10,000 times. Despite his failures, he stood by that dream until finally he was driven to the discovery of the genius that slept within his brain. Editor's comments. Dean Kamen got to know his other self very early in life. While he was a teenager, Kamen started his own company, building and selling control systems for automated sound and light shows. He was still in high school when he got the contract to automate the Times Square New Year's Eve ball. Though he went on to attend university, he never bothered to graduate because he was too busy working on something he called auto syringe the first wearable infusion pump for administering drug therapies. His invention was hailed as a medical landmark, as were many of his other breakthroughs, which include a revolutionary kidney dialysis machine, an insulin pump for diabetics, an improved stent used for heart patients, and more than 150 other devices he has patented. One day, seeing the difficulty a man in a wheelchair was having getting up a curb, Kamen set his mind to creating a device that would liberate people confined to wheelchairs. The result is the iBot, a revolutionary wheel device that uses computers and a system of stabilizing gyroscopes that imitate the working of the human body. It not only goes over curbs, but it will even go up and down stairs, travel over almost any kind of rough ground, and will allow the user to raise themselves eye to eye with a standing person and it does it all without the user having to get out of the device or needing anyone's assistance. In 2001, Kamen hit the front pages when he introduced the Segway, a one-person people mover based on his iBot technology. It's a two-wheel scooter-like device that zips and zooms forward, backward, left, right, and comes to a stop without the rider doing anything more than barely shifting his or her body. It is so sensitive that it is almost as though it obeys the user's thoughts. The Segway may be a world-changing invention, with possible applications for work and travel that stagger the imagination. As this is being written, the Segway is already being used to navigate large warehouses and is being tested by police departments and postal employees. While traffic cops in City Hall wrangle over whether the Segway belongs on the sidewalk or the road, Dean Kamen is dreaming a new dream. This time, the dream is an invention that may literally bring light to some of the darkest corners of the Earth. Cayman has developed a non-polluting electric generator that can use almost anything as fuel. But here's the extraordinary part. He has created a revolutionary closed system so that the engine's heat is used to purify 10 gallons of drinkable water every hour. This amazing invention could bring safe drinking water to parts of the world where contaminated water kills millions. And at the same time, it will provide a source of cheap, reliable electric power. Dean Kamen is not some academic hidden in a lab somewhere. Kamen is an inventor. But like Thomas Edison, he is also an entrepreneur and businessman, creating and marketing devices that are changing the public perception of what an inventor is. This is the end of the editor's comments. Henry Ford, poor and uneducated, dreamed of a horseless carriage. 
he went to work with what tools he possessed without waiting for opportunity to favor him. And now evidence of his dream belts the entire earth. He put more wheels into operation than any man who ever lived because he was not afraid to back his dreams. Editor's Comments Stephen Jobs and Steve Wozniak, two university dropouts, dreamed of making and selling computers that the average person could use. Like Ford, working with the tools they possessed, they built the first Apple computer in the Jobs family garage. And like Ford, they weren't afraid to back their dreams. After showing their prototype to a local retailer, they got an order for 25 machines. Jobs sold his Volkswagen, and Woz sold his expensive Hewlett-Packard scientific calculator to raise $1,300 to start their new company. They took the money, convinced the local electronic suppliers to grant them a line of credit, and started production of the Apple One. They revolutionized the computer hardware and software